Plus, an explosion destroys a local woman's home. Now, some wonder if the blast could have been prevented. That is tonight's top story. And thank you for joining us, everyone. Doris Wallace thought she smelled natural gas a few weeks ago, but the gas company found nothing. A short time later, she used a lighter, and it blew up in her face. She never imagined the two could be connected until her house exploded yesterday. Carol Evans' John Croman reports. It happened in the middle of a pouring rain. Neighbors heard what sounded like thunder, but it wasn't from the storm. I, I looked over toward Doris's house, and at that point I saw the garage door fly right off the house. And then I saw, um, I believe it was like sheetrock and, and uh, insulation and things just kind of flying in through the air. It looked like it was snowing out. I ran over there, and then I realized that her house had exploded, and at that point the roof just went up in flames. Doris Wallace, you see here with the bandages around her head, wasn't home when her condo exploded. The bandages are from something that happened here two weeks ago when she went to light a cigarette. She said that it just like exploded and her hair started on fire and and then she was trying to put out the flames with her hands and and um, then she ran over to her kitchen sink and put her head under the faucet. Back in July, a week before Doris was burned, she called Minnegasco because she smelled natural gas. A crew couldn't detect any leaks at the time, but did find one after the explosion. The repair crews traced the leak to a point about 30 feet in front of Doris Wallace's front door. About six feet underground here, they say a piece of polyethylene pipe, just like this one, was damaged and leaking. Minnegasco was back a day later, aerating the ground and checking for stray gas. But and some neighbors talking? can't help but worry and wonder how long they've been at risk. I moved in about a year ago, and uh, I've called them seven times in the last year, and four times they found small leaks, but I always smell gas around my house. Now, the Eden Prairie Fire Department and the State Fire Marshal are still investigating this. They don't have an official cause, so it's too early to say whether or not the leak they found in Doris's front yard actually migrated into her house and caused all of this. But in the meantime, if you smell gas, Minnegasco wants to hear from you. The number to call in the metro area is 612-372-5050. Outside the metro, try 1-800-722-9326. But don't make that call from inside your house. If you smell gas, we're told you're supposed to get out of the house as soon as you can, make the call someplace else, because if your house is really full of natural gas, just picking up the phone and making that call can be enough, Rick, to actually ignite the uh, blast. John, are they saying there's even any chance that that leak could have been outside the house and caused that kind of damage to the house? Well, what they're saying, Rick, is that the leak, which was underground, can follow the pipeline once it gets out of the pipe along the trenches and get into the house because gas is always trying to find its way up and out, and this might have been the most convenient place for the gas to go. All right, John, thank you. In other news tonight, six shark attacks along one Florida beach in two days. The latest victims are a 17-year-old girl and two surfers all along New Smyrna Beach. There was probably five sharks on this side and six or seven on this side. One, one went right under me, came behind me and just grabbed my foot and yanked me off my stick. Just bit me and let go and I came in and didn't know I was bit until I got inside and blood was everywhere. Three other surfers were attacked in the same part of Volusia County yesterday. Of the 37 shark attacks reported worldwide this year, nearly half of them were in Volusia County. A passenger says a Greyhound bus driver repeatedly fell asleep before crashing the bus, killing one person. Dozens of others were injured when the bus skidded off the interstate this morning. The bus was headed from Kansas City to Nashville. Firefighters are working feverishly to save an entire tourist town in Washington. Crews are creating a fire line using old trails and previously burned timber. They're trying to contain a group of wildfires closing in on the town of Leavenworth. More than 50 homes have been evacuated. They're among thousands threatened by the fire. The stuff that we've been doing is structural protection. Today we're going to be doing some new stuff. Hopefully uh, we can get a hand on these fires that, that, we're, that we're working on today. So trying to isolate the smaller ones and hopefully pick up the bigger ones later on. So. Firefighters are battling 30 other fires across the West, charring more than 500,000 acres. Well, you get another shot at more than $100 million Wednesday. No one picked the winning Powerball numbers last night. The jackpot now jumps to at least $175 million, making it the third largest in history. 
Well, taking a look at the week ahead, the Metropolitan Airports Commission decides tomorrow whether to offer full noise abatement to 3,000 homes or a scaled back version to 10,000 homes. They are able to meet federal standards covering more homes with less noise reduction. The FAA will make the final call. A giant tunnel-making machine needed for light rail construction at the airport has arrived by ship in Duluth. Tomorrow night, two trucks driving side-by-side side will carry the monstrous drill down I-35 to the Twin Cities. And by this time next week, the great Minnesota get-together will be in full swing. New attractions include acrobatic pirate shows, robot battles, and fried candy bars. You can see it all here on CARE 11. We are broadcasting live every day from the fair that time of year. For years, you could only find it on a handful of late-night channels. But now, a locally produced television show is hitting the big time. And the bowling is getting underway live from uh, Stardust Lanes in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Tonight, Let's Bowl made its national debut on Comedy Central. The campy, competitive bowling show taped at a White Bear Lake bowling alley has been a cult classic since it started in 1995. Over the years, it's been turned down by TV networks from MTV to Paramount. But now, Comedy Central is buying 10 episodes of the show. There were many times where we hoped it would just go away. And, and you know, Tim and Rich and, and would just say, you know, okay, that's it, we're done. I'm not going to do it anymore. And then somebody would call and say, hey, we kind of like the show. I go, man, okay, back at it. <laughs> Let's Bowl airs on Comedy Central at 9.30 on Sunday nights now. Producers say there is already talk of a second season. 30,000 Twins fans converged on the Dome this morning, all for a doll. Carol Evans, Rhonda Kinchlow witnessed the Kirby Craze firsthand. Set up the tent for because we're going to be here for bobblehead day tomorrow. Bobblehead! Bobblehead! Just came down to get a Kirby Puckett bobblehead. Bobblehead! Bobblehead! Kirby Puckett was considered a champion on the field, and now some of his celebrity has been packaged for the second time as a bobblehead doll. But this time, it's the little doll that's keeping fans up all night. We're one of the nuts, but we got three of the four, so we need the fourth one and add to our collection. The Come As You Are Bring Your Own Blanket Slumber Party on the lawn and sidewalk around the Metrodome <laughs> began more than 12 hours before the bobbleheads would be given out. If I was going to get one bobblehead, this would be the one. By morning, the line for the 15,000 Minnesota Twins Bobblehead Hall of Fame Kirby Puckett doll snake the distance of a home run several times over. I'm getting this for my brother who lives in Cincinnati. That's why I'm here, is to get his bobblehead that he's, he lives in Cincinnati. He owes me, big time. So how likely is it that you're going to get a bobblehead? Oh, pretty good from this spot here. With twice as many people in line as bobbleheads available, the giveaway began. We're not allowed to give any more than for however many people they have, even if they have extra tickets. Even a smile won't give me a, won't get me one. Oh, I'm sorry. No, this is a little more chaotic, but it's not as big. There you go. And it didn't take long to empty the boxes. I ran out. I'm all done. So I got mine. This little guy was given the last bucket bobblehead. <laughs> it's outside where we found a woman willing to buy a bobblehead. She wants to buy your bobblehead. Oh no, I'd never sell my bobblehead. But, she... but what's some treasure, others are just waiting for the right price to sell. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Okay. Just like their hero, Kirby Puckett, the fans never give up. $80. Oh, so that worked out. Rhonda Kinchelow, CARE 11 News. Some of the Kirby Puckett bobblehead dolls have already shown up on eBay selling for as much as 150 bucks a piece. Well, coming up on CARE 11 News at 10, Tim has the disappointing details of Twins action on the field. And in the extra, turning around your 401k plan. Good advice for bad times on Wall Street. Plus, the latest on tropical storm Chantal gaining strength as it churns across the Caribbean. First, there's Bell. I'm meteorologist Belinda Jensen, and this week we had a little bit of everything. We had the wettest day in a month yesterday, and then look at how nice today was. Just some fair weather cumulus and lots of sunshine. I'll have this week's forecast coming up in a couple of minutes. You're watching the news on CARE 11 with Rick Cubchella, Belinda Jensen, and Tim McNair. This is CARE 11 News at 10.
In tonight's extra, the ups and downs of Wall Street and what it means for your 401k. Until late last year, most people never really lost any money on their 401k investments, but the stock market's volatility has made many of us feel a little uneasy about our retirement nest egg. Tonight, Care 11's John Croman offers some simple advice for fixing your 401k. Wade and Stephanie Sin assume their plants will keep growing. They once felt the same about their retirement accounts. Then came the year 2000. From October to December, went down another 13%. Quarterly statements brought sobering news. I went down $600. So now I'm below what I actually originally started off with. I felt like I was kind of out of control. And even though I have a lot of years to work, I still felt like that's money going down the drain. I didn't really have any control over it. They weren't the only ones. From 1999 to 2000, the average 401k account fell nearly $5,000 in value, a drop-off of 10%. Here's where the money went. Most 401k accounts, by their very nature, are tied to the market. Most of your 401k money goes to mutual funds, which in turn invest in stocks and bonds. So when markets fell, so did 401k. People are saying a lot of people saw their values drop so much they thought their 401ks turned into 201ks. Um, it, it was a tough year. Financial advisor Tom Taylor says this is no time to lose faith in your 401k. In fact, he believes it's a good time to put more money in it. Absolutely fabulous time right now. You look at this five and ten years from now, you're going to wish you had a whole lot of money to stick in the market in these years. So can you rebuild your 401k nest egg? Or are you always going to be at the mercy of the stock market? Well, not necessarily. You see, most 401k plans give you choices, different investment baskets, if you will, where you can put your money. Some can grow your money faster than others, but the fastest growers generally carry a higher risk of losing, too. You decide how much risk you can tolerate. That'll depend on your age and how many more years you plan to work and contribute to your 401k. That's tip number one. Check your risk tolerance. Risk tolerance is just the swan method, as my team calls it here, and that's sleep well at night. What allocation your portfolio will help you sleep well at night? Investment broker Dan Amon says you may want to reshuffle the money inside your 401k, but do so carefully. Don't make a rash decision now to completely change your portfolio, but rather devise that plan that will help you reallocate as we move into a recovery in the market. That's tip number two. Don't overreact to stock market swings. To realize that investing is a long-term process, uh, the, the last 12 to 18 months has been a painful but necessary part of market cycles. Payne Weber's Ben Marks says most of his clients are counting on time to heal their 401ks. Time is always your ally when investing, and a younger person can afford to take more risks and can uh, handle the ups and downs of the market over its cycles. While you can't avoid ups and downs in the market, you can cushion the impact on your 401k. That's tip number three, diversify. Spread your money across a mix of low-risk and higher-risk investments. An analogy that I use is if you're out on a Lake Superior on a choppy day, if you're trying to stand on one leg, meaning one type of investment, it's hard. Okay, two legs is better. Four legs is even better. <laughs> Along those lines, here's tip number four. Avoid accumulating too much of your own company's stock. Not only are you risking your financial capital that you're saving for your family's future, but you're also depending on the company for your economic livelihood, your career. Which brings us to tip number five. Seek professional advice. Neil Anderson came to Tom Taylor, who advised him to move his money to stocks that he expects to recover more quickly. For me, it wasn't like, gee, I want to get out of equity things and dump it all into the bond market. If I was going to, smart enough to have anticipated the plunge, I'd have done that beforehand. As for Wade and Stephanie, Tom advised them to stay with the investments they have. I'm just going to stay the course for right now for what I have. And, um, and just educate ourselves more on the choices out there, and hopefully our meeting with Tom will go well next year, and he'll say that... We've done good in the choices that we've made, and we're gaining. They'll have years to catch up. John Croman, CARE 11 News. Well, that's a lot of information to absorb about 401Ks, but here's one more word of advice from the panel of experts we consulted. Try not to tie up too much of your money in a 401K. Try to keep some in more short-term investments so you'll have cash if you need it in an emergency. It's all good things to mm. listen to about this time. Just have, what, three months cash? In emergency, yeah. if you can, ideally. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's uh, a nice we, concept. Yeah. It theory. is, isn't it? A theory, that's right. <laughs> well, there's uh, obviously not a lot of weather going on here in the Twin Cities today. It's been very quiet. Of course, yesterday we had some much needed rain. We'll tell you about that in a minute. So we're going to start out in the tropics to let you know what's going on with Chantal.
probably heard about her late last week. She's been a tropical storm all weekend. She did increase intensity up to 70 miles per hour, so she was almost a hurricane when she was south of Jamaica. But just in the last hour, she has decreased her intensity down to 65 miles per hour, and she is moving um, north-northeast at 18 miles per hour. It looks as though there's not going to be any change. She's a little bit unorganized at this point in time, and you can barely even see the eye. And right now it is 325 miles east-southeast of Mexico. So it doesn't look as though this one's going to be a problem, but of course, if you live in the Gulf states or you have uh, maybe some property down there or friends, they're of course watching each and every one of these storms. And of course, Chantal is the third storm of the year. Let's take a look at our almanac and see how well we did today. Compared to yesterday, you know what? We had a little bit of everything this weekend. We had much, much needed rain yesterday and then absolutely a beautiful Sunday. Today it was 79. We started out at 54, very close to both of the normals. And the sunrise today, 620, sunset 813. And yesterday we had 1.3 inches of rain in that storm. Some areas reported over two inches in the northern suburbs. Everybody got about an inch from the rain Friday night and also on Saturday. But we are still below normal for this date. Let's take a look at the current conditions. It's now 71 with calm winds. And our dew point is very comfortable at 55 degrees. Well, as we take a look at the radar or the satellite picture for the upper Midwest, you see this is the storm that brought us all the rain Friday night, and then of course most of Saturday was pretty wet. It's a very strong low pressure center just winding around, and then of course the back side of that was over us on Saturday early in the morning, and that's when we got a lot of moderate rain. Now this was uh, 8 o'clock last night, and it's been moving off ever since and left us with a very nice day. Now as we look off to our west, to our for the weather of course coming in for this week, tomorrow looks like it's going to be very quiet. Then after that point, we do have thunderstorms possible, and then a warmer end to the week as we head toward uh, Thursday and Friday. Here are some temperatures still very comfortable at this hour, 71 in the Twin Cities and 64 in Mankato. So what's going to happen the first part of the week? Well, we still have this high pressure center over us this evening. That will move off to the south and east. This low will start to move out of the Rockies, and tomorrow will be beautiful. Then on Tuesday, by Tuesday morning, that warm front is going to be knocking on the door in the southern part of the state. That's going to move northward, and that will be a focal point for thunderstorms on Tuesday late in the day. So count on thunderstorms Tuesday late in the day, Tuesday night as well. And then this warm front is going to push north on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And that leaves us back into the heat as we end up the week. Let's take a look at our forecast in detail. For the Twin Cities, clear and cool tonight. We drop down into the 50s with light winds. Tomorrow, a beautiful day, another one. Mostly sunny, pleasant, and around, right around 80. Then as we take a look at the rest of the week, those late day thunderstorms on Tuesday and Tuesday evening, 82. And then Wednesday looks nice, 79. And then here comes the heat again, 84 and 85 for Thursday and Friday. The greater Minnesota forecast tonight, clear and comfortable. Tomorrow, pretty quiet everywhere. There's a slight chance of a thunderstorm in Bemidji and Walker late in the day, but everyone else hovering right around 80, 81. If we could only package today and just keep it all the way through the fair, it would be very comfortable for us and all of our viewers. But, uh, of course, it's going to get hot and sticky as the fair begins. Of course. Of course. We count on it. I know. Thanks, Bill. Right. Straight ahead in sports, Tim wraps today's PGA Championship final round. And bobblehead fever didn't keep the Twins from bobbling another matchup with Tampa. Details when we come right back. Time now for sports, and uh, can we just stop playing Tampa now? Can we just? We're done with them for a while we're at least. Good. Let's just admit we're not as good a team as the <laughs> Devil Rays are, and that's scary to even oh, say man. that. In sports, sometimes one team just has another team's number, and that alone might explain why last place Tampa Bay keeps beating the Twins. But let's face it: since the All Star break, Tampa has just played better baseball than the Twins, and they did again today. And the Devil Rays waste no time in getting to twin starter Eric Milton, Toby Hall's first inning single, scores Damian Rolls and Ben Grieve and gives the Rays a quick 2 to nothing advantage. In the second, Tampa's Felix Martinez takes Milton deep to left for a solo home run, his first upping the Rays' lead to 3-zip after 3. Meanwhile, Tampa starter Joe Kennedy holds the Twins to just one run on three hits as Tampa tops the Twins 5-1, to one, handing the Twins their 27th loss in 37 games since the All-Star break and leaving TK at a loss to explain why.
We just got to straighten out our own game, worry about our own game, not somebody else's. So we have to concentrate on the Twins and doing the best for the Twins, getting the ship going in the right direction. Well, the PGA Championship comes to Hazeltine next year, and we can only hope that tournament offers the same kind of excitement generated in this year's event. It boiled into a showdown between Phil Mickelson and third-round leader David Toms. And when Toms birdies number 14, he owns a two-shot lead at 16 under par. The tables turn on 15 when Mickelson chips in for birdie, while Tom's bogeys forging another tie at minus 15. But a bogey on 16 means Mickelson needs this birdie putt on 18 for yet another tie, but lefty right. leaves it short, meaning Tom's can win with this 12-foot par putt, and unlike Mickelson, Tom's runs it right into the heart of the hole, giving Tom's a dramatic one-stroke victory in the 83rd annual PGA Championship. It's just like a, a dream come true. It's like, you know, one of those goals that you, you set for yourself, but you don't know if you'd ever, ever quite get there. And um, I made it. For his efforts, Tom Pockett's just short of a million dollars. Mickelson's still looking for major victory number one. Steve Lowry is third. Mark Kalkovecchia and Shingo Katayama both finish four shots back. Tom's victory also knocks Tom Lehman out of an automatic berth on the U.S. Ryder Cup team. Lehman is still eligible for one of two captain's choices, and those selections will be announced tomorrow. Batting leadoff in tonight's two-minute drill, the Twins get another gift from Mike Sosha's Anaheim Angels. In Cleveland, Troy Gloss goes deep off Bartolo Colon, and then Anaheim ace Jared Washburn does the rest in a 4-1 Twins win. Twins still four and a half back in the AL Central. Back to the Atlanta Athletic Club in the PGA Championship, where the shot of the day is turned in by Scott Hope on the par 3 17th. There were two aces turned in yesterday, but the only one today comes on that shot by Scott Hope. In Brookline, Michigan, Sterling Marlin passes Bill Elliott with 53 laps to go in the Pepsi 400. And when Rain puts a premature end to the Pepsi on lap 162, Dodge owns their first NASCAR victory in the last 24 years. At the Little League World Series, the Florida team that had a perfect game thrown against them on Saturday recovers nicely against Washington. Florida gets into the win column with a 2-0 victory. And how about Tiger Woods at the PGA Championship? I think this shot out of the bunker on 11 tells you all you need to know about how anybody can be humbled by golf. The great Jerry Rice returns to San Francisco, but this time as a member of the Oakland Raiders. And why did the 49ers let the NFL's greatest receiver of all time get away? Because they've got a young game breaker by the name of Terrell Owens. And today, they got a 2017 win over Rice's Raiders. Well, it's good to see that winning Wimbledon has made Goran Ivanisevic grow up. Ivanisevic is out for his come in his semifinal loss to Gustavo Kirtan in the RCA Championship. Defensive gems turned in today by Chicago Cubs second baseman Eric Young, who robs Arizona's Greg Council, and then by Boston's Shea Hillenbrand, who also goes airborne and showing you why they call third base the hot corner. Nicest moment of the PGA Championship? What well, had to be when Greg Norman signs his trademark hat and goes over and gives it to a young man in the gallery and makes that his day. And finally, it's what had over 30,000 fans waiting in line outside the Metrodome. We have this one question. Does that look anything like Kirby Puckett? I mean, anything at all? Uh, just a quick reminder that the Prep Sports Extra returns on Friday, August 31st. Randy Shaver once again calling the shots. And you can find the Prep Sports Extra Friday nights at 11.05 on your local PAC station. Apparently, having your own bobblehead, it doesn't have to look anything like you because that could have been anybody. Chad, our floor director here, asked yesterday, since when did Chris Rock get his own bobblehead. I was thinking Harry Belafonte. <laughs> I know. Something's up. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Tim. Still ahead, a maze made of maze southwest of the city. Plus, a look at tonight's winning lottery numbers when we come back. Four, nine, three, folks. Write it down. I'll tell you again in a minute. Before we go, a corny map of the United States that is bound to get most people lost. You are getting a bird's eye view of a corn maze that's about to open in Shakopee. While it may be confusing on the ground, from above you can see all 50 states. Today, neighbors created a human outline of Minnesota. It took 14 acres of corn, or three quarters of a million plants, to design the maze, and it opens to the public September 15th. There's Alaska. How cool is Where's that? Hawaii. Yeah. I don't see Hawaii. I see Alaska. I don't see. That is so cool. You know, the sea, I think it's Seavers. We went there and did a little thing, and when they, I think they did a dinosaur 
Jurassic Park thing. Yeah. That is really cool. But when you're in it, you're just looking at corn. <laughs> you need a helicopter. <laughs> but no, helicopter. it is very, very cool. It is a cool thing. So, <laughs> hey, we uh, have your five-day forecast. It's going to be great for corn maze. Uh -oh. You know, look at that. 80, 82. That's yeah. corn kind of weather. Even in the rain. It'll be, It'll be great. <laughs> have a good week.